For the next hour or so, we want to focus on the very important role of the economy um, that the economy plays in the protection of the environment. As we all know, non-renewable -re resources play an important role in the context of climate change. Accordingly, our next panel focuses on the future of these resources. Focusing on oil and steel as two examples for non-renewable resources, the upcoming panel investigates how our reliance on these resources impacts climate change and which opportunities exist to preserve them for the following generations. To discuss these questions, I want to welcome on stage our distinguished speakers. Mohamed Sari Sari from the Environmental Matters Unit at the OPEC. Welcome. We also welcome Adrian Frey, an active climate reality leader who gained a lot of experience working in the oil and gas industry. Welcome. <laughs> Damoji Chatteri uh, from Sustainable Energy for All. <laughs> Thomas Jakowiak, the Executive Vice President of Integration Management at the RHI Magnesita. And also our facilitator, Pia Nagel. <laughs> Pia is a student at the Diplomatic Academy and she holds a Master's of Arts in History from the University of Vienna and a Master's of Science in Global Env Environmental Governance from the Free University in Amsterdam and is also part of the DASICON team. Let's welcome them all on stage and let's have a great panel discussion. Thank you, Lisa, for this nice introduction. And good afternoon, and welcome to this first panel session in the afternoon at the DASICON 2020. I would like to start right away, and I would like to start with a number, with a number that I think is very important, and it's 415. Some of you probably know what I'm getting at here. Uh, if a researcher in the uh, mid-18th century sat down, and he would have looked at one million atmospheric particles, he would have seen that about 280 of them are CO2 molecules. He would have thought this is a boring, uh, rather boring result, though, because this number hadn't changed for about 10,000 years. <clears throat> now, last year, in May, in Hanui, in Hawaii, researchers did the same thing. They, they measured the CO2 content again. And it was not 280 particles, but it was 415. So within the last two and a half centuries, we have nearly, uh, we have added nearly 50% uh, of CO2 to the atmosphere. And this is mainly due to, um, <clears throat> due to human activity. And of course, mainly due to uh, the burning of fossil fuels, uh, which of course uh, release CO2 that's otherwise captured. Now, uh, of course, we all know that a big part of our modern lifestyle, our entire uh, economy uh, system, is it's mainly based on, on fossil resources. Uh, and this is coal, oil, but also mineral resources, such as uh, steel, uh, magnesium, and so on. Um, now, so the, the important question is how to move forward from this. How can we uh, get towards a more sustainable world and using our resources in a more uh, durable way, in a more sustainable and efficient way, uh, while at, this, uh, at the same time <clears throat> uh, not ousting any parts of our society. Uh, to discuss this, these interesting questions, I would, uh, be, yeah, I would uh, like to further introduce uh, the speakers today. Um, <clears throat> right next to me is Mr. Adrian Frey. Uh, he worked for the OMV for over 10 years. <clears throat> And for those of you who are not uh, from Austria, OMV stands for uh, Österreichische Mineralölverwaltung uh, and is an important oil and gas company in this country. Uh, he was responsible for areas such as health, safety, security, uh, environment, emergencies, and stakeholder management. And uh, clearly, quite literally, uh, is an expert uh, from the field because he used to work in uh, oil and gas fields in Austria, New Zealand, Yemen, the Kurdistan region of Iraq, the North Sea, and Madagascar. 
Uh, today, he's engaged at the, uh, as a lecturer at the University of Applied Sciences in Pinkerfeld, and he's also engaged as a climate reality leader project. Uh, <laughs> he's also engaged at the Climate Reality Project, which is an NGO founded by former uh, US Vice President Al Gore. Um, next, I would like to introduce you to, Mohammed, uh, to Mr. Mohammed Ali Sare Sare. He currently holds the position of uh, environmental coordinator at the organization of the petroleum exporting countries, uh, OPEC. This organization has 14 member states, which together account for uh, over 80% of the global oil reserves. And the goal is to, uh, and I quote, coordinate and unify the petroleum uh, policies of its member countries and ensure the stabilization of oil markets. <clears throat> Uh, before this, Mr. Sari Zari worked with the Iranian uh, Foreign Ministry, and through this, he participated in countless international and, um, international and intergovernmental events and negotiations. <coughs> Welcome to our panel. Now, next to him, um, I want to introduce you to uh, Mr. Thomas Jakowiak. He is the exec ex Executive Vice President um, of Integration Management at RHI Magnesita. And RHI Magnesita is a company which uh, extracts minerals that contain magnesium. It then u uh, uses those to produce refractories, which are products that can make other materials heat resistant. Hmm. They are used very regularly uh, for indeed for steel, um, uh, steel, glass or cement production. Now, a key responsibility of Mr. Jakowiak is the sustainability strategy uh, of the company which aims predominantly at reducing the CO2 footprint, which is in this area, I guess, a, an interesting task. And last, but certainly not least, uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and last, but certainly not least, I want to, uh, to introduce you to uh, Tamuchi Chaturi. Uh, he works as a partnership officer for Sustainable Energy for All a program which was launched by the former uh, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. And the key goal uh, of the organization is to support progress on sustainable development goal number seven, which is, and I quote again, to ensure the access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all. Mr. Chattery's uh, tasks include the management of the corporate uh, partner relations, public-private partner platforms, and strategic plannings, amongst others. Now, most importantly, <laughs> as I think um, he's not only uh, someone from Sustainable Energy for All, but also a uh, DA alumnus. Welcome back. <laughs> Thank you. And the first question sort of is, is the, the lead question and uh, uh, sort of an opening statement. Uh, as I mentioned before, we focus on the future of renewable energies. <clears throat> Uh, and whether we can use the situation where we are now uh, as a, um, whether this is only a challenge, like was it, whether it is only a hindrance to climate action, or whether our sort of reliance and dependence on these resources and our intensive use of fossil uh, resources, uh, whether this can also be seen as a precondition for this change that is coming up. Mr. Frey. Uh, I would like to start with you. You have seen uh, different, many different sides of the coin. You've worked sort of on the field, but as a climate um, uh, activist, in a way, you also see the, the other side. Could you give us a brief uh, overview of your uh, take on our topic today? Okay. So uh, maybe it's still elaborating uh, quickly on introduction and then coming back to your question. So thank you, Pia. Thank you very much. Also, thank you very much for the whole organizing uh, committee of DASICON. So really uh, great job. Cong congratulations for that. Um, dear, change, dear change makers, yes, as heard, um, it's a bit both sides of the coin for me. It's uh, over 12 years in the oil and gas field itself and then moved in a company to future mobility. Um, however, in the field, it was more like the green part of the business, um, led by environmental um, topics as well as safety, security, but also crisis management topics and stakeholder management. And um, with this, um, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't want to forget also as a society where we are, uh, where we are today, um, oil and gas as such brought us here over the last century. Yeah. But it's a bit like with the career, with your own career steps. What brought us here won't take us there. So maybe it's time for a, a controversial rethinking 
of where are we standing as a society, where, where do, how do we move on. And um, yeah, I also faded out uh, of the company, so it's not on behalf of the company what I, what I can um, explain, but from my own experience. What I definitely see is that many or almost all oil and gas companies are having a big push nowadays also in uh, new energy solutions in renewable um, fields. Um, and you can uh, keep the question open for yourself if it is a push from the public, if it is an inspiration from inside, uh, and especially if it's fast enough and enough by itself. Um, which I leave open to your own judgment, um, but something is happening and that's already a good part of that. Um, I, allow me to, to add one question to that, to, mm -hmm. the, to the audience, um, simply because um, also as a company, be the change you want to see, every individual is doing that. Um, can I simply ask you and all of you, um, do you believe, if you then look back maybe 2035, 20, 2050, do you believe that we will achieve the 1.5 degree target as we agreed in the Paris Agreement? Do you strongly believe that we will achieve that? Thank you, Julian. Thank you, Christina. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> we give this so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a handful of us. Um, I would very, very much hope, yeah, after the introduction you had today, maybe also after the panel at the end of the day, that some more hands are joining us, uh, because we heard before it's not a goal, it's a necessity. So however we make this necessity real, help us, everybody with its own pace and, and what we can do, um, but um, please let's reconsider how many hands we could see in the future on that question, and I was hoping for a few more. <laughs> so, and uh, just to finalize, those who maybe not raised up, just ask yourself, who, if not you, in this room, and maybe even here in the part of Europe, we're some of the most fortunate and best educated people around. So who, if not us? Uh, and then I'll uh, yeah, add <laughs> more to the topic in a moment. I just want to see this setup as well. Thank you. I will take that rhetoric question. Uh, who, if not us? And also, who, and if not we as a community and as a collaboration of all the individuals, but also of organizations, uh, national inter uh, organizations, international organizations, transnational organizations. Uh, and this is, uh, yeah, and I would like to, to give the word um, over to you, Mr. Sari Sare. What is your take on this, on this issue? How do we go forward? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, let me also express my appreciation for the invitation and the excellent organization of this meeting. Uh, let me begin on why we need energy. Our modern civilization uh, has utilized all sources of energy to ex expand production of goods and services, as well as enhance economic growth. Along with other energy sources, the demand for oil and gas has uh, increased profoundly to provide affordable and reliable energy services to various sectors of economy to meet the growing demand for goods and services. Energy contributes significantly to the economic growth, enhancing productivity in various economic sectors, and increasing income levels. Energy has also a strong interlinkages with almost all sustainable development goals, and contributes profoundly to poverty eradication, food security, health and quality education, economic growth, and productive employment, building resilient uh, infrastructure, and promoting sustainable cities and human settlements. Lack of access to energy and energy poverty, constrained productivity and efficiency of various economic sectors, curbing their competitiveness and their ability to create decent job opportunities with sufficient levels of income for the, for, for the families. Energy poverty will also hamper the efforts to provide basic social services for all, especially in developing countries. Uh, more than 800 million people in the developing world do not, do not have access to electricity. And around 3 billion people lack access to modern energy sources for clean cooking, with serious associated health problems especially for women and children. With the global population estimated to increase from 7.6 billion in 2018 to 9.2 billion in 2040, especially the growth will be in developing world, 
all energy types will be required to meet the rising energy demand and provide modern energy services in an accessible, sustainable, and reliable manner to all. All energy outlooks from reputable research institutions forecast that oil and gas will continue to have the highest share in the global energy mix for the foreseeable future. Therefore, oil will remain an important part of the global energy mix for the period of 2018 to 2040. And in absolute terms, the oil demand is expected to grow by 10.6 million barrels a day in this period to reach to 100.7 billion barrels a day in 2040. While in relative terms, its share in the global energy mix will be slightly declining from almost 32% in 2018 to some 28% in 2040. Oil is forecast to remain the fuel with the largest share in the energy mix over the period to 2040. Climate change continues to be one of our major challenges of our time. However, environmental and climate change challenges are not related to any source of energy, but rather the GHG emissions from their consumption as the main challenge that should be addressed. Technology and innovation is key to finding action, uh, solutions and actions to reduce uh, GHG emissions from using various energy sources, including fossil fuels. There's a need to enhance development and adoption of various types of cleaner energy technologies, especially CCS and CCUS, carbon capture and storage and carbon capture use and storage, as well as inclusive policy frameworks to address all energy needs in an efficient, sustainable, and climate-friendly manner. The initiatives by the oil and gas industry at various levels, including by Oil Gas Climate Initiative, OGCI, to promote capacities for technological innovation to address related environmental and climate change challenges. Thank you. Thank you, too. <clears throat> I thank you for the in very interesting uh, numbers. Uh, I think that's, uh, the, there are some really, really important ones, especially with the, with the rise in energy demand, <clears throat> which we're clearly facing. Uh, and um, yes, ob obviously, uh, resources and uh, energy use has a lot to do not only with um, uh, with international organizations but also quite frankly with uh, companies and I would like to give the, the word over to uh, Mr. Jakobiak. <clears throat> what do companies do uh, to create this more uh, sustainable futures? What are they doing? What can they do? And uh, how, are we how are they reacting to a uh, rise in, in energy demand, as uh, suggested by Mr. Sairi Sari. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, it's great to be here. Frankly speaking, I actually passed by many times this wonderful building. That's the very first time also to sit in here. Um, and you're right. I mean, we as an industry, we need to drive also the change. Um, and you mentioned at the beginning, I'm actually in the refractor industry. This is usually the point where the people ask me what the hell a refractor is. Um, and refractories are pretty simple. Um, you need it for the production of steel, cement, non-ferrous metals, and glass. Now, by saying that, you actually see that refractories are essential for, for basically our daily life. So, and, and what the refractor is doing is also pretty simple. They are actually preventing the steel vessels, the cement vessels, from being melted because there are high temperatures inside. And as I said, if we don't have any steel, if we don't have any cement, so our daily life will actually not exist. So refractories as such are really essential for um, what we're actually doing and what we're doing, and let's say all for our, let's say, developed um, life. Our refractories, of course, are actually really essential. Now, how are refractories produced? You mentioned at the beginning magnesite. Our core raw material to produce um, refractories is magnesite. And for this, we extract this material from mines. In addition, we need to burn it. How do we burn it? Yeah, here again, we are with fossil fuels. At the moment, we are doing this mostly with gas, oil, in some cases, even with coal. Um, and, and I mean, honestly speaking, there's no other process to do so. So, um, and then at later on a later stage, once the, the raw material is processed, then we also need to burn our finished products. And at the end of the day, we exhaust, and that's a reality, we exhaust CO2. Um, I mean, 
But we have one, let's say, important saying in our company. We don't want to be any more part of the problem. We want to be part of the solution. And as such, we, did, we actually developed a CO2 strategy. Um, and first of all, we were thinking about what can we do ourselves. And there are different levers. Uh, for example, uh, recycling, fuel switches, to be more energy efficient, and so on. And this brings us, and you mentioned this at the beginning, this Paris target, 1.50 degrees um, of, um, let's say, temperature increase. Um, and this brings us halfway to the Paris target. But, I mean, it's still, we have a big gap. And at the moment, we are really, uh, and our IT people are working on this on a daily basis, what do we actually do to prevent, or let's say to use, the CO2 we're exhausting. And we are running already with different other associations, like uh, in the cement industry we are aligned, with the steel industry we are aligned, and to develop new ways to utilize CO2. But also, to be honest and frank, we are here at the beginning stage. But honestly, I think we need to do much more. We need to accelerate much more. And uh, at the end of the day, it's a reality that the climate is changing. <coughs> and the climate is changing, what I actually feel is changing much, much faster than it was like 10, 20 years ago. So we need to react faster. And this would be my opening statement. Thank you very much. We certainly need to react fast and faster. Thank you very much. Uh, with this, I would like to, uh, to come to Mr. Chattery. Uh, you are engaged at Sustainable Energy for All, uh, as I mentioned before. What is your take on this? Where, where do we start? Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, and uh, I'm honored to be part of this panel. Uh, and it's great to be back at the DA, uh, rather than on the other side. Uh, I'm sitting in, on stage, so it's a special moment for me. Um, I have three broad categories that I can essentially talk to about. Let's look at the facts, right? As uh, Mr. Zaire mentioned, we are nowhere near track to meet SDG 7 targets. There are 800 million people in the world who still lack access to electricity in 2020. That is unacceptable. That is 12% of the global population that still don't have access to electricity. Where does that main problem lie? 600 million people who don't have access to electricity out of that 800 figure actually are in sub-Saharan Africa. There are 3 billion people who still have no access to clean cooking technologies, which uh, has, uh, you know, as Mr. Zaire mentioned again, uh, has, has tremendous effect on health on women and children who are disproportionately affected. So what's the, what, what's the solution to this? If we, if we look into, let's follow the money. Out of the $51 billion year on year that the world uh, currently requires to meet the energy access gap, we just have $36 billion that are being committed. In clean cooking, the finance commitments are actually decreasing to the extent that only 1% of the required amount is actually being met. We are actually even decreasing in terms of the growth, the rate of improvement of energy efficiency year on year. So my question then is, is it all bad? Are we absolutely going to lose the game here as humanity? My answer is no, there is a lot of good news that also uh, we need to celebrate and then look at the opportunities. More than 150 million people uh, gained access to electricity just in the last year. Countries who have made significant progress are those that have made energy access a political priority. They have put greater focus on integrated <coughs> universal electrification plans and they are embracing all types of technology, including off-grid and on-grid solutions. The renewable share in 2010 was 8.6 percent. Today it is at 22.5 percent. That is a huge increase, there's a huge opportunity in renewables. The cost of solar PV has gone down 80 percent in the last 10 years. The cost of battery storage has gone down 83 percent in the last 10 years. 
So when we talk about affordable modern energy access, it is very possible. So what is the opportunity? And I'm glad that we have companies, uh, we have organizations, and we have uh, leaders on stage that can actually talk about this problem in, in a more holistic fashion. I have, there are three ways that we can do this. Electrification, energy efficiency, and energizing finance. If you just have a 3% improvement in energy efficiency year on year, companies not only save a lot of costs and economic development is spurred, you actually meet 40% of the Paris uh, Climate Agreement targets. So what's stopping companies and countries from prioritizing the first fuel, that is energy efficiency? Uh, electrification can solve a lot of the current emissions uh, problems that we have uh, in terms of buildings, in the transport sector, uh, in residential use, and of course also in industries. 50% of uh, total electricity consumption can actually be powered by renewables as soon as 2035. So while there is a problem and we are not on track, there is so much of latent opportunity that the market is moving towards. And I think it's time that we all seize the moment and talk about how we can make it possible rather than just focus on what are the barriers to solving that problem. Thank you for your optimism. <laughs> and your... And your, and your engaging words. Uh, now, as this, as this panel sort of features the uh, economy part of the, of the conference, I would like to return to one of the basic sort of um, things economists tell us. We've learned it even here at the DA uh, yeah, recently. Uh, and apparently states, when they want to uh, s support a behavior, Economists tell them to subsidize it, and uh, if states want to um, hold us back from engaging in a behavior, they would tax it. For instance, the taxes on smoking are very high, so we would tend to smoke less, obviously, whereas um, education, for instance, is subsidized um, to support going to school and uh, learn something. Now, interestingly, in the field of climate change, both things are not entirely working out, are they? Um, we've been struggling for decades now to have a functioning <clears throat> um, CO2 tax, but also the uh, subsidies that we still pay for uh, fossil uh, fuel resources is something that, for instance, the International Energy Agency vehemently criticizes. Uh, the numbers of, of last year uh, amount to $500 billion um, dollars that have been paid by governments uh, to make uh, fuels, uh, fossil fuels and fossil resources in general more, um, uh, more accessible, more affordable for everyone. Now they uh, recommend to, uh, to draw those, those subsidies back and they uh, expect um, an important leap towards uh, renewable energy from this. Uh, and this is something I would um, like to um, discuss. And we had a quick chat before the panel, <laughs> all of us. Uh, and I heard that Mr. Chattery is working on this. Um, and I would like you to, to comment on that first. What, uh, what role will do fossil fuel subsidies uh, play in your, in your field, especially working with, uh, with the SDGs and making uh, uh, energy modern, but also uh, affordable for all? What's, what's your take on um, yeah. fossil fuel subsidies? So the $500 billion per year number is pretty stubborn in the fossil fuel uh, industry. And there, there has been a lot of discussions around what is actually the value, the real value of subsidies in the sense, uh, is it really an efficient model of providing affordable solutions to people. I come from India, and uh, we used to get a, a LPG uh, you know, uh, supplied at 
heavily subsidized rates uh, at home. But speaking from my personal experience, I can actually say that uh, the, these LPG uh, subsidies actually disproportionately went to the middle class and the upper middle class people who could anyways afford the real price of subsidies, uh, without the real price of uh, the fuel without the subsidies. Uh, and the India story is, 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 a, is a brilliant story to look at uh, because what the government over the past four years did is that they tried to move the subsidy uh, away from uh, just the middle class population and the upper middle class population to people who actually needed it through direct cash transfers. Uh, one of the, and, and, and India has had tremendous success in terms of, uh, you know, increasing the rate of clean cooking access through uh, LPG. So there is definitely a role for LPG to play there, and we recognize that. But if you look at uh, the, the cost of solar, uh, it's, it's, an, it's, it's again a brilliant story where solar price costs and prices have plummeted to the extent that it's cheaper to actually uh, produce uh, solar than, than, and then, than produce electricity from any other source. Uh, solar competitively and consistently beats fossil fuel uh, production uh, in terms of absolute costs. Uh, one of the interesting studies that, uh, that I was reading were from the Bloomberg New Energy Finance is that they said that if you even move 10% of that fossil fuel subsidy towards investments into renewables and modern sources of energy, uh, we, we can actually meet the renewable energy targets. Uh, if governments plan better in terms of prioritizing energy efficiency and uh, invest more money into creating policy frameworks and standards and regulations that look at demand side energy efficiency, we can meet the targets. So uh, that, that would be my take on this is that uh, let's, let's really look at who the subsidies are actually benefiting and how can we make that uh, system more efficient. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Mr. Frey, as I mentioned before, knowing, knowing different sides, uh, what, what is your take on, uh, on this? Um, first of all, I'm thankful, Tamajit, that you also put out uh, good news, the development, um, but also I'm pointing the status quo and uh, the development we have on the ground. So both sides need to be appreciated and we need to uh, focus on, on, on the correct way forward. So um, with bearing that in mind, um, another figure that I might throw in, um, if we take the serious the, the target of 1.5 or respectively 2 degrees, let's keep it to 1.5. Um, we have proven reserves of oil and gas in the ground with a whole network all around the world being invested heavily into over the last decades or a century. These proven reserves that we're simply not allowed to burn anymore if we want to achieve uh, the 1.5 degree has a value of about 22 trillion US. Yeah, so 22 trillion dollars are in the ground not allowed to be burned, which is not a good idea anyhow to burn something valuable, but anyhow. Um, Somebody wants to be made up for that, and that we shouldn't take that out of the conclusion that uh, people invested, companies invested, whoever, countries invested into this system, which functioned pretty well up to now and is still functioning. So uh, having this um, in mind that there's a huge amount of um, money being bound if we are not allowed to touch it, and hopefully we will not need to, um, then we also need to see the other side. Okay, how is it made up for it? So the good news is, as you can see from solar, you can produce cheaper electricity than any other method. That's a good way forward. However, for the whole scale, it needs to, it needs to make sense. And then also what you said about uh, the subsidies, um, I want to highlight on, which is really true. This 10% that you uh, mentioned in real numbers, it's actually from last year that in overall, in all the renewables worldwide, 150 billion were invested in renewables. Just let the numbers sink, because on the oil and gas side, it's over 5 trillion. That it's actually 500 from the IA. However, if you include all the national plans and subsidies, it's about over 5 trillion. Forget the numbers, it's about 37 times more than for renewable. So it's 37 times more to keep the existing system than to invest into a new one. The point is, like you said, 10% seemingly would be enough to have both in an in a equilibrium. I think this is the target. Can we achieve those 10% out of those 37-fold? 
among this number um, to, to be specifically, uh, specifically used and spent there. Yeah? It's not cannibalizing the one or the other, it's just really saying, okay, what does it make sense to really achieve these targets and to prove that it works. Yeah? And we have a huge system which, which needs to be maintained anyhow because it will not happen from today to tomorrow, but we need this route, we need this perspective. And with this 10%, I think it is a um, planable um, challenge that we have. Okay, thank you. Um, now, this will, of course, have uh, an effect on, on the economy, especially on, on companies and the, and the financing of, um, hmm. uh, of resources. Uh, Mr. Jakowiak, what are your thoughts? Um, well, when, when, when I listen here, um, and mostly I wasn't very much aware of this, but obviously we have so much subsidies uh, going into the fossil fuels. I mean, I can only agree. I mean, at the end of the day, it's about making the change and, and, and really getting more money into, into renewable energy. And honestly, as a, as a company, we also this, we need and we will support this. But what I think is, is, is for us important and, and for our company is... Um, let's say, uh, active globally. So at the end of the day, it's about also about competition. So we need to stay competitive. So we cannot afford that we actually run ahead and our costs are increasing. And at the end of the day, we are run of, out, of, out of competition and we are basically no longer competitive uh, globally. So, I mean, I think what is important that at the end of the day, we as a society see that we need to drive the change. And what I'm currently seeing also very much is um, and we're speaking a lot about governments need to need to need to move forward. Governments need to impl implement, um, or let's say, subsidy uh, the usage of renewable e uh, energies. It's also let's say about us and our, as a company as well to drive this. And, and I mean, I mentioned earlier how we're doing this. Um, and at the end of the day, it will cost us money. Um, but what we cannot do, of course, at the end of the day, is also we cannot afford to lose comp uh, competitiveness. So it needs from ourselves, it also needs from, from, from the society, from, from industries as well, um, that all of us are actually moving into this direction. And I'm seeing this happening, to be honest. What I'm seeing is at the very moment that investors are looking very much how is the series two strategy. So we, we actually reveal our numbers, the CDP platform we already did. So there is a coming pressure, even coming from investors, to move much more into renewable energies. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I read. I actually read on your homepage and the uh, sustainability strategy mm -hmm. uh, that you will reduce uh, the CO2 emissions by 10% per ton um, by 2025. 20, uh, yes. Um, it also says. <laughs> I was wondering about this. It also says compared to 2018. And if you look at like usually at um, <clears throat> at those sort of emission targets, they usually always. Uh, use 1990 as a, as a reference point, or the average between 1960 and 1990. Why is it, uh, why is it 2018? It's pretty simple, because we are, as you, as you mentioned at the beginning, we are called RHI Magnesita. So RHI Magnesita, and we merged in 2017, and as such, we are, since 2017, a new company. And of course, when you're a new company, you're much bigger. At the end of the day, you exhaust more CO2, so we need to st actually start where somehow the maximum. So we cannot go back like 20 years and say, well, we're going to compare like 20 years ago. We need to be realistic. Mm -hmm. And realistic is a year like 2018, where our CO2 emission, because of, let's say, the joint, uh, um, joint operations in our, in our company, are, let's say, on a, a, a such on a high level. And on this, we need to work on. It doesn't help us to compare it like 20 years ago, which is maybe was much lower. <laughs> Let's face the reality. Yeah, certainly, certainly. Um, yeah, thank you, um, Mr. Sairi, Sorry, coming back to uh, coming back to fossil fuel <laughs> subsidies. Uh, now, uh, of the uh, OPEC member states, quite a few have areas which are especially vulnerable to um, climate change, um, <clears throat> and therefore, I would. Uh, yeah, I would just want to ask you as well for, for your opinion on the, uh, how do you see, or like how do you prepare uh, for um, a change in fossil fuel subsidies? Um, uh, of course, uh, just let me just uh, mention that. Uh, I believe that uh, this issue of the subsidies, first also on the issue of the assessment of the subsidies and accounting, there are some differences among the different, uh, you know, uh, thoughts, uh, school of thoughts, how to assess 
what is the really the amount of the subsidies that should be provided, at least be accounted that as subsidies. So it means that some say that, for example, the, the cost of the, uh, for example, the extraction of the uh, fossil fuel uh, is, you know, in some areas is less than the other countries or the other places geographically. So uh, they don't call it as a subsidy, rather whether the, the real price of the extracting of the uh, uh, fossil fuel or, or oil, gas, or, uh, for example, the coal. So uh, secondly, of course, it depends also on the national situation. For example, I just, uh, I, in the developed world, now we have a, the service sector is increasing and just growing very fast, while the uh, you know, industrial sector, just uh, manufacturing sectors, is not at that stage. In the developing world, it's different, that the countries would like to expand the industrial basis, the agricultural basis, to make sure that they can have uh, economic growth, poverty eradication, and also to increase the level of incomes for the family to be able to have the basic social services mm -hmm. that is needed. So, uh, as a uh, colleague mentioned, even some, in some areas, they provide subsidies to make sure that the people will have access to uh, modern energy services mm -hmm. with less pollution, in-house pollution, mm -hmm. to make sure that the people will be able to have clean cooking. So we cannot, uh, you know, say at least one solution is fine for, for every country or every situation. Either we should go to the different uh, countries, different uh, uh, levels of development, and in some areas, for example, even just to make sure that the uh, agricultural products will reach the markets, we need to subsidize the transport that carry the agricultural products to the market to make sure that the uh, farmers will have as income to be able to uh, grow and to have poverty eradication. So I mean that we cannot find a, just a, say this is the solution and we should follow it and it's the best to follow it. Rather we should see these different situations among countries. Even in the OPEC member countries nowadays, some of them they are reducing, you know, the, they are increasing the fuel costs and using the additional incomes for the cash payments to the poor. So these are the different ways and means and options and solutions that the people find. But let me just also mention that the energy access in developing world is a major challenge. And they needed to make sure that they will grow, they will be able to increase the incomes and to be able to provide the social, basic, basic social services to the poor segments of the society. Thank you. Thank you, too. Uh, thank you for these interesting insights. Uh, time, is, time is moving fast, apparently. <laughs> uh, and this is why I would like to, um, to pose the next question, uh, which is which sort of concrete uh, project or which concrete next step do you think is the most um, important one in this context? This can be uh, the elimination of, of subsidies or a carbon tax or uh, something else if um, you see something else more important. After this, we'll have a quick uh, uh, round of questions from the audience. So if you can already think about interesting questions, please feel free to do so. <clears throat> um, Mr. Chattery, <laughs> would you like to start again? <clears throat> yeah. Um, in, at SE for All, we uh, mainly look at energy access, uh, which is combined with, you know, looking at the broader spectrum of how do you get energy access through renewables and other sources, uh, and how do you improve energy efficiency. Um, I think one of the biggest takeaways is that we need more commitment. We need high-level action, and we essentially uh, have to work together with companies, with governments, in order to solve the problem. There is no, there is no point in finger-pointing or, uh, you know, uh, like extreme activism on both sides, if I can say it that way. Uh, 
one of the things that we try to do is uh, we have these multi-stakeholder partnership platforms that is one of the best ways to actually get very different perspectives together with very common objectives and actually get that discussion going. So when it comes to energy efficiency improvements, we, 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 we work with 15 countries and with more than 50 companies uh, from from the uh, you know from 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 industry from utilities uh, across the value chain essentially in in terms of and ask them the simple question around how do you go from 1.2 percent energy efficiency improvements every year to three percent and uh, and and you know if you look at if you look at companies uh, like asset management firms like BlackRock, if you looked at uh, the recent news that BP, for instance, said that we are going to go net zero by 2040, uh, you've, we've got to work with the leaders in the space, and, and we have to have more finance, more commitments, and better policy frameworks that allow for these enabling environments for new business models to thrive. So that would essentially be sort of my takeaway in terms of how we solve this issue. Thank you. And Mr. Jakowiak? Honestly, I can only agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, I mean, everything that you mentioned is absolutely true, but um, maybe I would like to add, I mean, it starts with actually each and every one of us. It starts with, when you think about what can I do personally uh, to reduce my CO2 footprint. As the, honestly, I think it starts with this as well. Then, of course, it goes into organizations. What can particular organizations, what can, can companies do uh, to reduce their CO2 footprint? And, and at the end of the day, it needs to be clear, our ultimate goal needs to be CO2 neutrality. We, as a company, are not there yet, to be honest. Yeah? We're going to have face big obstacles, and let's say we're going to have a lot of work to do to go there. But um, I think at the end of the day, it starts with the each and every one, and if each and everyone thinks about their, his, his own um, carbon footprint, then also I would say more people will be engaged, will be encouraged, organizations will be encouraged, or, um, governments and companies will be encouraged to do more. And I think that's, that's let's say, what, what I would think about it. Absolutely, absolutely, thank you. Um, yeah, and as, as we saw uh, earlier, I, I was some <laughs> one of the slides that made me very happy today was uh, of, of uh, Professor Patberg earlier, the slide that showed how the individual flights has gone, uh, have gone down. So we see individuals are taking initiative, they are flying less, uh, they are eating less meat, and yeah, I think that's that's a very good good point to encourage <clears throat> to encourage. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sari Sari. Uh, recommendation of one cr concrete detail, one concrete project? Uh, uh, no, I, I believe one of the important elements for the how to deal really with this uh, climate change issues is the uh, initiatives by the companies, by the sectors themselves, just to make sure that uh, whatever they can do and provide just to make uh, and contribute to the reduction of the emissions. I mean, all the GHG emissions uh, from the different sectors, not only from the energy, also from the land, degradation and also from the other uh, uh, sources. So uh, in the oil industry, at least, there are some initiatives. We have, as I just mentioned, that we have OGCI, All Gas Climate Initiatives, that the companies have come together and just put some money just to provide seed money for uh, innovation, for new technologies, to address the different sources of the emissions of the, uh, uh, from the industry itself the methane and the other GHG emissions. And also uh, the CCS, the carbon capture and storage. The CCUS, carbon capture use and storage. These are the different uh, areas that we need more actions, more innovations, more technologies, just to be developed and to be provided to the, uh, uh, on the ground, just to, for, to, to the different businesses to make sure that they will be able to reduce the emission and bring down the concentration of the carbon in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, furthermore, uh, I believe that it's also, as just, uh, our colleague mentioned, that it also goes to the individual level. Because, for example, the per capita emission in some countries is much, much higher 
than the other countries. It's very higher in the developed world compared with the developing world. Absolutely, that difference. So it, it needs really to make sure that you know it, it, it needs equity. In those countries, in those developing countries, they need to consume energy to be more, uh, to grow, to uh, have poverty eradications. But at the same time, in some of the developed countries, we need to make sure that we will, re we will reduce the per capita emission, that it comes also reducing the, the per capita use of energy. We cannot have one individual uh, consume six times more than an individual in the developing countries. So it's very important how we can have really to address our lifestyles, to be able to have more equity across the globe for everybody to make sure that all of us will contribute to the reduction of the reduction of the emission sources. Thank you. Thank you too. Um, <laughs> The numbers, the numbers do definitely vary a lot. And uh, for instance, if you look at the, uh, or like, uh, a country like Austria uh, has about eight uh, tons of um, CO2 emission per capita per year. Uh, and <clears throat> um, yeah, many, many countries in, for instance, uh, sub-Saharan Africa don't even meet one ton per uh, capita per year. So the differences are massive. Um, so yeah, there are different different starting points. Um, <clears throat> on a concrete recommendation, uh, Mr. Frey? Yes, it will follow in a second. I just want to add to the two numbers you gave now, the 8.5 and then what other people in the world have. Um, bear in mind the 8.5 for us, as an average in Austria, yes. But uh, if we take the Paris Agreement serious, we should be between, depending on calculation, somewhere 0.8 to 2, two tons. Yeah? So this the one person somewhere in, in other parts of the world, maybe he had the one ton that he has, that's actually a target for the average person worldwide, which is an enormous challenge. Mm -hmm. yeah? It's like noticing 31st of December, I want to use 20 kilograms now <laughs> for the new year. So just that, that this is the uh, respect if we talk to. The one item you asked me, to, you asked me about, um, one thing is I keep it with Katharina Rogenhofer. I'm pretty sure in this room, everybody has done it already to vote for the, for the um, popular climate vote. Um, if not, she didn't, she didn't push on that. It's also uh, possible um, uh, on your mobile device. Yeah? You don't need to go to the Gemeindeamt or wherever. Too. So this is the one. I put another one, which is efficiency, that we shouldn't let ourselves be fooled that things will happen anyhow. We are used to very, 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 very inefficient system, simply because it was cheap enough up to now. So we are used to this inefficient system. And other things, like we heard about green hydrogen today, they will not just happen by chance. They will happen because there's a push in the industry from, from, from people around, and there's a demand for that. Yeah? Taking in, in consideration, we have, whatever it is, eight years. Give it 10 years, whatever. But let's keep these eight years serious, and we cannot wait that then green hydrogen comes in 12 years or whenever. And another one is uh, if you're allowed to vote, not only here, but maybe also in the US, or anybody of your friends, um, fun fact. Um, in the, the U.S. can legally not withdraw from the Paris Agreement until the very first day after the next presidential election. <laughs> so this is also the one item that I recommend any of my, our American friends um, to keep <laughs> that in mind. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Now, are there any questions from the audience? Uh, and do we have microphones? <laughs> okay. Uh, first, uh, the lady at the back, Adriana, please, and then uh, Chrissy as a second. And uh, let's take a third question as well, one third question. Uh, the, the, sorry, uh, the lady on the, on the side. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. Sh should I ask the question? Yes, Can please. I ask? Okay. Uh, uh, so I'm Andriana Bascone. I work in the energy efficiency field. I'm also a climate activist. I've co-organized the Austrian Youth Climate Conference twice here. So I believe in making a change on this topic. I just wanted, uh, like I would also would have, like, would have been nice maybe to hear like right now from everyone what not we should do, but what they are going to do in their company or their institution. So like not what the consumer should do or the um, normal citizens, but what you are planning, because we were talking a lot about 
topics and subsidies and frameworks, but not really much about what you are planning to do. And so my question is a different one, uh, especially going to Adrian's fray, because you are very optimistic. If you would reach the 1.5 goal, also realize that funnily, uh, especially fossil fuel companies seem to be most optimistic uh, about reaching these goals and scientists and everyone else uh, really who looked at this issue are not so optimistic. So uh, I suppose that um, you are building very much on gas, natural gas, which is not a renewable resource. Uh, and so I'm referring to Adrian Frey especially. And I wanted to just, yeah, I wanted to ask you that, or I wanted to point out also to everyone in the room that WMFAO and as many other companies have tried to green their image very much. Uh, by setting up new programs, so like if it's a new energy solution uh, division in the company or something different, have put a focus on hydrogen, have put a focus on maybe expanding, uh, looking into different uh, areas of application of gas, also biogas, but I just want to point out that most, the billions uh, many companies make, they come from oil and gas. And so, and as I see it, I do not, uh, like I don't see any big, vision of really changing the business model right now. Uh, and so I suppose that you refer to gas and hydrogen and CCS, so carbon capture and storage, as something sustainable that uh, will contribute to the 1.5 goal. So I just want to ask you, what are you doing? Uh, maybe also the other companies in the panel to reach this goal and especially to sustainable energy for all. You were referring to uh, commit uh, to framework, policy framework that you would want to see. What were you referring to? Uh, exactly. And so also this kind of vision or what are you doing, I will also bring that to OPEC because I would like to ask you in a world which is sustainably friendly, which is um, which kind of where we are on the right, right track, what is the role of OPEC? Is it going to be there? And is there any self-criticism in the organization itself? So especially referring to the crisis right now with China and so on. Thank you. And the next question, uh, yeah, the lady in the front. Um, my name is Stella Wittmann and I'm in the um, NGO Plastic Planet Austria for plastic reduction. And I have a um, um, question to Mr. Thomas Jakowiak. Um, um, if you know uh, who, is, who is choosing your, your giveaways, giveaways, and um, I wanted to ask you um, why uh, do you choose um, products from uh, polyester and polyacryl for sust sustainability project. Uh, if you have heard that microplastics are washing out um, a lot, like six kilogram um, of polyester makes uh, half a million microplastic beads and it washes out. So why do you uh, choose such a product for susten sustainability? Thank you. Yeah, good point. <laughs> uh, and the third question, please. Hi. Thank you. Um, Christina Hoover is the name. Um, my question is really, we talked a lot about uh, giving electricity access and energy access to uh, people that don't have it at the moment. And it sounded very much like the oil industry is the only one capable of giving that um, why did we not talk about leapfrogging? Why do people first have to have a diesel generator where there's immense amounts of pollution that come with that? Why don't we leapfrog to sustainable energy and to renewable energy? Thank you. Uh, hang on, hang on, hang on. Is, uh, is your question directed to anyone specific or general? Okay, thank you. Great question. <laughs> thank you. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the questions. Uh, one more? We have time for one more? Okay. One more. Uh, just, here you go. <laughs> the gentleman in front. Yes, thank you. Um, I've been working many years uh, in the f this field, and I'm very much uh, sensitive to what has been said. I think uh, I'm very glad that now um, the issue of the developing countries has been issued, especially the need for energy. Um, what I would like to add, it is not just for cooking and so on. I think it's, uh, uh, I want to mention the issue of water and agriculture, the nexus of the three. This is one of the central issues 
not only in the developing countries, but everywhere. Now, um, uh, here, exactly, the uh, renewable energies can play an important role. This is one side. The other side, which has been mentioned very briefly or not at all, is the question, the demographic question, that the people um, are uh, reproducing themselves very fast, that the income uh, which they have at their uh, disposal is moving up. Uh, there was a tremendous increase of um, average income and they can and need to use more. So this is the key to the, uh, the whole issue of energy and uh, uh, climate in the future. And we have to find solutions to that. Renewable energy, yes. Water, water and agriculture. Think of that. Hang on, excuse me? Is that, uh, what, what exactly was your question? The question is whether you agree with that and what you see as solutions to that. I mean, one, let's, let's give you one solution. That's, for instance, for water, there is a um, lack of clean water. Mm -hmm. One way to uh, get it is to, re, uh, to, to clean the uh, wastewater. Mm -hmm. But for cleaning the wastewater, you need energy. Um, equally for agricultural production, you need energy. Mm -hmm. well, also, I don't want to give a lecture on that. I mean, I could give you if you wish. But I'm, I'm saying that please put a focus on that and give me your answers. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we've got four very interesting questions. We don't have too much time left, I guess. Um, so I, I, uh, yeah, I ask for uh, brief, on-point, interesting answers. Mm. Uh, just uh, as a reminder, so the first question uh, was on uh, what exactly your organizations are doing uh, to combat climate change. Um, uh, the second one was directed to Mr. Uh, Chattery. It was on the policy framework. Uh, the third one was on the uh, on the role exactly of OPEC in this. The fourth one was on the present um, uh, the, the, the goodie bag <laughs> from Magnesita exactly, and the and the issue of, of microplastics in those uh, towels. Um, and then we had um, <clears throat> the um, water and agriculture. Ah yes, yes, and the uh, the water question. Uh, uh, from from uh, towards the end, uh, and that we need a lot of energy to clean uh, water, which is needed in many areas uh, of the world. Who would like to start? Comments. I mean, maybe I take the first one. Uh, what are we doing? Uh, we are actually doing an organization to um, fight climate change. And I mentioned at the beginning, we set up na la last year, and why didn't we only la did last year? Also to explain this, because as such, we are a pretty young company. After the merger, we actually set our CO2 strategy. Now, what are we doing? Um, and I'm, I said, our ultimate goal is, of course, to comply with the Paris Agreement. Um, and we've thought about many levers. I mean, energy efficiency was one of it, uh, because we do use gas. And um, we were thinking about different ways of be doing this more efficiently. Yeah. Um, and we see there is a contribution there, so that this is really helping us. We see also a possibility to switch to renewable energy wherever possible. This, of course, let's face it also, this is a, a journey. This is also not happening tomorrow. And what we're seeing also, our material um, to recycle our material, which is, and you need to imagine, uh, we deliver, deliver to 180 countries in the world. And I mean, getting this back to our facilities is not that simple. So I mean, everything build, I mean, is basically on the, on the way to be, get implemented. We have a proper projects in way, on the way. But let's say the self-help brings us halfway to the Paris Agreement. And on top of it, we need to think about, and we do not only think about, we always have research programs uh, towards um, CO2 utilization. Will this happen tomorrow? Also not, definitely not. Yeah. But um, what I'm seeing is that we as an organization, we are aware and we need to make sure that at the end of the day, and I can, cannot tell when, we need to be carbon neutral. 
and maybe I already take the question regarding the, the, the giveaways. Um, thank you very much for this. You know, to be honest, I mean, um, we wanted to really bring a, bring a nice, nice giveaway to you. But, but honestly speaking, I wasn't aware. Thank you very much for this, and we need to be more mindful in the future. <laughs> I, can't, I, I can't promise Kashmir, <laughs> but more environmentally friendly. Yeah, no, but, 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 but honestly speaking, thank you very much. For, thank you. It's, 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 a, it's a very good uh, uh, information and hint. We were not aware of it. We have not been enough mindful for this, but thank you very much for this. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the input. <laughs> uh, anyone else who would like to comment on um, what exactly your company or your organization is, uh, is, is doing? Uh, uh, of course, the, let me just mention that the OPEC is an organization that is working mainly on the research activities. And of course, uh, we are working also closely with the initiatives for the addressing of the new technologies, for the, especially for the CCS, CCUS, and also other innovative uh, innovations that could help to reduce the emissions. We are working closely with the IEAGHG that is focusing on the issue of the carbon capture and storage, and just to developing uh, the reports and also sharing it with their membership to utilize them in their industries and the relevant industries, especially oil and gas. Furthermore, of course, we have the member countries themselves that, of course, we encourage them just to take the initiatives in this area. And some of the companies are taking initiatives. They are a part of the OGCI, Oil Gas uh, Climate Initiative, and just contributing uh, financial resources for the innovation. And also at the national level, the different uh, national companies are also taking initiatives just, just to reduce the flaring, just to utilize it for the other more efficient ways, and also to use the carbon as feed in the petrochemical industry, just to produce uh, perhaps more valuable uh, products without just uh, letting it just to uh, uh, be emitted. So there are ways and means. But uh, let me also mention that it is also necessary to make sure that the, the investment is a critical issue because investment in a sector would also help to develop new and innovative technologies to really to be able to address climate change. We, nowadays we see some uh, calls for the, uh, you know, just to crowd out the investment out of the uh, oil and gas industry. Uh, it can also affect mainly the development of the technologies and innovations that could help to address the climate change issues. So, uh, of course, we, uh, we believe that uh, we need to have a quite, uh, leave the options and the policy rooms, a policy uh, room for every country and every sector to, make, to enable it to address the climate change. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Would you like to continue? Um, those are very interesting questions, and thank you so much for whoever talked about leapfrogging to renewables. I absolutely uh, am with you on that point. That's, so that brings me to what we do with, uh, you know, w what kind of policy frameworks are we talking about, right? Um, we work mainly with, uh, you know, countries in sub-Saharan Africa uh, who have the biggest uh, energy gaps. Uh, and one of the things that uh, we have seen that has worked in some of these countries is universal integrated energy plans. So it's talking about how do you talk about productive use? So how do you talk about water and agriculture nexus? Uh, how, how do you talk about residential households? Where does mini grid and off grid solution play? Uh, and where does the central grid a actually can extend to? It's really about planning. It's about better data for policymakers to take the correct decisions. And it's about, it's about governments actually planning based on the data and evidence uh, guiding them rather than political considerations. And um, I, I think uh, that, you know, so, so what we do is we actually work very actively with countries in terms of providing them pol policy guidance bringing that data and evidence to light, and then work with them in terms of these universal integrated energy data plans. Uh, sorry, di not data plans, uh, energy plans, right? The other thing, uh, the other part of the story is where is the money coming from? Where, where is the finance? There are 
a lot of innovative uh, financial instruments uh, that have come up in the last five years. Uh, so we work with uh, development banks, we work uh, a lot with impact investors uh, in terms of having results-based financing uh, facilities. Uh, if you, there has been a lot of good news that has been coming, especially from the DFIs, where if you look at just the European Investment Bank, uh, they're, 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 they're not going to fund uh, fossil fuel investments or majority of fossil fuel investments anymore, and they're shifting that money to renewables. Uh, so the, the, the question is, how do you bring all of that together, that you have the cleanest energy source being given uh, to, to these countries, and how do you work with these governments to close the energy access gap in the most affordable, modern, and reliable way? So that's basically, uh, I hope, answers your question. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, and we're at the end of our panel session. And uh, who, hasn't answer, uh, who hasn't had uh, a comment on the questions yet uh, is Mr. Frey. And I will also grant you uh, the last okay, perfect. comments, All right. please. Good, because there were some directly. Thank you. Um, maybe with, with the discussion here, I'm not only here as a shareholder and change maker to a certain extent, but also as a father of two daughters. And maybe that's the main uh, drive, actually. Uh, that could also explain why I have this optimism, why I try to keep up this optimism, and why I try to uh, share solutions which are, which are viable. Um, however, with uh, different questions that came back, I try to, to, to walk through them, um, is also that I'm not with OMB anymore officially, so Ariana, I think you were responding to that, um, so I cannot make a direct statement what I think as a company should do, but what I can um, confirm uh, from experience of what I see is that really any oil and gas company has a very, very high stake nowadays to show and to do and to research into this field. Um, you already showed your skepticism how far that goes. Uh, the point is that there are really good technical solutions, partly there, um, and they coexist with a big other system, yes. So let's see how we strive this, this promising uh, part. Um, Shell, for example, is, is, is targeting now to be the biggest electricity producer in the world. Not anymore oil and gas, but biggest electricity pr producer, simply because we will need green electricity so hundredfold more than we have it nowadays in order to succeed anything in that, in, in that, that direction. If you want to do power to liquid fuels, if you want to do green hydrogen, whatever, it starts with green electricity. So that's why, yes, there will be a big push and there will be a lot of uh, going on in this industry. Um, with, um, there was one question also, what is the companies otherwise doing? Yes, gas is one next step, CCS is one project, so many different ones. What is um, ultimately also important is going more and more into petrochemical, of course, simply not burning the stuff. Yeah? Burning something valuable, not so smart. That's why really petrochemical is one part. The issue is, um, I like the Pareto uh, rule, Pareto, the 80-20 rule, um, doing something with 20% effort and getting out 80% of the, of the gain. The problem is petrochemical only gets 20% of the oil. 80% gets to some other use, and out of this 80%, 20% is used, as you know, for, for heat and uh, moving us forward, and 80% is hot air. So yes, we are in an inefficient system. That's simply what I want to say. And as long as we as consumers don't demand a change in any specific system you have, be it mobility, be it heating, be it whatever, um, a system will continue because it was quite successful so far. Um, so this is really so the, the, the demand again to the consumer, think what you want. Agriculture was one other point to, to cover the questions with agriculture and petrochemicals has been one part of that. Uh, we need to consider also from CO2 perspective that a lot of ammonia um, um, mixes used in agriculture have up to 200, 300% CO2 um, global warming perspective than CO2 itself. Uh, so also how and where is it used is important. The same with methane, yes. Methane used as gas, perfect. Methane just spreading in the atmosphere. Uh, global warming potential, again, higher than, than, than while using it. So there are so many different, different parts which ends up with leapfrogging frogging, that we will need to put this jigsaw together in order to allow this leapfrogging, which is crucial. Definitely, it is crucial. Yeah, um, it is a big jigsaw. It's, it's a big puzzle we are, we are playing with. And I want to end what Mr. President, uh, Federal President Van der Bellen was saying that nobody is against change. He said this morning, I have to disagree with him. I think changing is really hard for most of us, and changing a habit is even more hard, and changing industry is maybe the hardest. Um, but being open for change is important. And this 
Another question was that the personal one item that you do is really trying to advocate, trying to, to, to lead the way, trying to show up op options, not, not judging them, but showing options, um, is something that I personally want to do um, in order to really make people aware of what change could be possible and not just waiting for something. Because again, we have eight years, so maybe time for waiting is not, not the first step we say. I invite everybody to keep this optimism if it's there. <laughs> thank you. These are very, very nice closing words. And with this, I would close the panel. Thank you, dear audience, for your attention and for your interesting questions. Uh, and thank you, of course, honored speakers, for your time and your valuable insights. And thank you, Lisa, for welcoming us here on stage. <laughs> thank you, Pia. <Bea. laughs>